Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm uh, Craig Riddell, an Emeritus uh, Professor from Economics. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to this conversation. Uh, there may be a few more people joining us as we go, but uh, this is a good time to get started. I'll be the moderator uh, for this conversation. Uh, at the outset, let me note that uh, I would like to, to like, take the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Uh, also note, as you may already know, uh, this event is being recorded for archival purposes. It'll be posted at the website of the college and you'll receive a link to, to it after it has been posted. So this is the, another in a series of conversations organized by the Emeritus College. Uh, we have three distinguished scholars uh, to address the topic today. And the topic is features of a post pandemic society, three perspectives. Uh, and they're going to each of our conversants uh, will offer their perspective on how changes due to COVID uh, may or will have a, a lasting impact on individuals and, uh, and societies. So uh, I'll let the three scholars introduce themselves uh, the, the introduce themselves and their areas of expertise. Uh, and each is going to take about five minutes or so to make some initial observations on the question at hand. Uh, and after that, we'll have a conversation among the three or the four of us. Two o'clock. I should also mention that uh, if you have any questions or comments, at any point uh, during the, the, uh, the initial phase of the conversation uh, to put them in the chat box and I will relay them a bit later on uh, to our three uh, conversants. So to begin, uh, let's, let's start with Peter Sudfeld, uh, who's going to uh, give his uh, views and comments on uh, issues that are relating to a post-pandemic society. Peter? Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Peter Sudfeld. I'm Professor Emeritus of Psychology at UBC and also Dean Emeritus of the Faculty of Graduate Studies. My research has mostly been concerned with people who are or have been under severe stress or in uh, environments of serious challenge, sometimes danger, sometimes trauma, and how they cope with those fa factors and what the long-term effect of having encountered them uh, has on the individuals. My, um, my emphasis in my research is on individuals, not on groups or nations or whatever. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. And I also want to mention that I'm going to be talking about the psychological impact of COVID and perhaps even more of what authorities were trying to do to control and lessen the impact of the COVID. So that's, that's what I'm going to talk about and also what, what the effects and what the foreseeable future outcomes of all of that are likely to be. Okay. All right. Um, I'll start with some psychological terms recently introduced, one of which is mortality salience. Mortality the salience refers to any environment or any information 
that increases people's awareness of their coming death, as is the case for everybody, of course. But in some cases, something happens that makes it more obvious, more salient, and more worrisome. The other term I'm going to use is terror management theory. And that is a theory about the reactions to mortality salience. That is when people's awareness of future death is increased, how do they react? Well, they react by trying to reduce that awareness, making it more tolerable, less uncomfortable and scary. Okay. Research has shown that the responses that are common in terror management have some good effects, but also some socially negative effects. And among the good effects, of course, is that they allay anxiety. They're buffers against the feeling of fear and anxiety as one contemplates the fact that they're going to die. The bad effects are to some extent social. For example, people become motivated to harden their attitudes about their own world uh, look, their attitudes on politics and religion and, on, uh, and also their adherence and support for their in-group. That in-group can be um, racial, religious, uh, sexual, gender, um, occupational, and political, and so on. But whatever, whatever um, in-group is being um, emphasized at a particular time, the person who is engaged in terror management holds to it more strongly than otherwise, than, than they would if that were not the case. Okay. Now, if you look around what happened with COVID, we were bombarded 24-7 by the media with COVID news, COVID instructions, COVID warning, COVID scares. A given constant and different and frequently contradictory advice on how we should cope, um, prohibited from doing many of the normal things that we do, visiting each other, going to work, going to the movies, et cetera, et cetera. All of that adds to the stress, adds to the anxiety, makes the COVID situation seem even more than it probably was, and so on. And one of the, one of the um, outcomes of that is that positions get harder and disagreements used to be the subjects of perhaps a more um, conversation and argument now become hostile uh, and occasionally violent. And to the extent that society is, is more um, riven by divisions, to some extent that is the outcome of uh, terror management techniques to, bust, to buttress one's um, fear of, of death by exalting the group that one belongs to and, and their beliefs and dogs and religious uh, tenets and so on, political uh, outlook, et cetera, et cetera. So much of the, much of the disorganization and um, partisanship that we see now in, uh, in society has been exacerbated, if not created, by uh, the effects of COVID, the non-obvious effects of COVID on psychological processes. What is the uh, outlook for this? We're looking at the, the post-COVID uh, world. Well, hi everyone. It looks like uh, Peter's internet there just clicked out but we'll try to bring him back. Connection disrupted, but I'm back. Um, the good news is that in studies of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, it's found that even with 
very traumatic events like uh, major earthquakes and floods, like the attacks on the Twin Towers in uh, September 11th on 01, things like that. The number of people, a proportion of people who eventually suffer from PTSD is someplace around 15% which means, of course, 85% of the people who suffer from PTSD. This is for people who actually experience serious physical damage themselves, okay? And the people who do take longer to recover and some don't. The people who don't have PTSD um, are usually subject to some post-traumatic stress symptoms, such as sleep disruption, nightmares, uh, occasional attacks of anxiety, things like that, but they don't interfere with normal life and the person can go about with their family relationships and friend relationships, with their work, with enjoying their usual hobbies and recreational things and so on. And the ones who do suffer from PTSD most recover more or less by the end of a year after the event. So we can look forward to that kind of recovery rate from the COVID um, pandemic and its psychological effects. Now, I'm not talking about its physical effects. I think what we're going to need to do is look at intergenerational transmission of trauma that has been found in some previous major traumatic events, and also the reemergence of trauma symptoms as survivors reach old age. Uh, especially if they develop dementia, some people experience flashbacks uh, to the traumatic time. But in general, uh, my prediction would be, and I know prediction is dangerous, but my prediction would be that within a year or so um, after the real ending of the COVID scare, uh, things will be heading back towards normal. I'm done. You're on mute, Craig. Hi. Sorry, I messed up. I forgot to, to unmute myself. Peter, thank you very much for getting us started on this conversation. Pittman, can you uh, take? Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Craig, for chairing this. Thanks to the Emeritus College for running the event and for the invitation to let me participate. Uh, my name is Pittman Potter. I'm a professor emeritus of law from the Allard School of Law here in, at UBC. And also I was for a time director of the Institute of Asian Research at UBC, which of course, both of which reflect my research focus on Chinese law and policy, PRC and Taiwan. Uh, recently, most recently doing work on human rights, uh, but uh, a whole variety of interconnected things. I've been working on COVID matters recently uh, in connection with a book manuscript that I'm doing on China responses to global challenges of COVID climate and refugee migration. Uh, I have a short paper uh, with uh, East West Center um, that, uh, that addresses some of the COVID issues. Uh, and uh, in terms of today's talk, I mean, I, I, not to be difficult about things, but I, I'm not sure the world is actually in a post-pandemic society. Uh, contrast Canada with our population of 40 million or give or take, and our drawing down of COVID controls. But uh, look at China that's had a recent lockdown of some 80 million people, uh, Shanghai 25 million, Jilin 24 million and so on. So clearly there's a lot of local variation and, and I'd be cautious about uh, assuming that we're actually through this whole thing. But uh, nonetheless, um, I hope today's talk is useful and I will be focusing on, uh, first of all, lessons from the past. Uh, China has had at least two major uh, uh, pandemic, epidemic uh, outbreaks, the HIV AIDS crisis running still goes on in China, but the, the, the worst of it was 95 to about 2003. And then of course the SARS uh, epidemic from 2003 to roughly 2005. And there were lessons from that in terms of critiques from the WHO, World Health Organization and others 
regarding China's lack of transparency and cooperation in allowing uh, both information and uh, remedial measures to be uh, discussed and put in place. And that, that was a legacy from the HIV, uh, AIDS, and SARS epidemics of the past that continue to impact uh, Chinese behavior uh, today. I'll, I'm also interested in the socioeconomic impacts of COVID in China. So for example, the lockdowns are critically important and have had an impact on China's economic productivity and impact on world uh, supply chains and so on. And of course, in addition to the lockdown of Wuhan at the very early stages of the crisis, as I mentioned most recently, uh, last December, Xi'an, city of Xi'an in Northwest China, 13 million was locked down. Uh, the special economic uh, zone of Shenzhen in South China was uh, Guangdong was uh, locked down, 17 and a half million people. Uh, the province of Jilin, uh, 24 million people was locked down, and most recently Shanghai uh, with 25 plus uh, million people was locked down. So, so these lockdowns have a very important impact on people's uh, social life and their ability to move about and communicate, and it has a big impact on the economy as well. Uh, we've also seen disparate impacts of COVID on gender, so uh, domestic violence rates have uh, skyrocketed during the periods of lockdown. Uh, we've seen uh, differential treatment and, uh, and, and care for uh, residents versus migrant workers. Uh, and we've seen disparate impacts on, eth on ethnic minorities. So, so COVID uh, has uh, these intersectoral uh, impacts on China that are worth paying attention to. Uh, another element is the Chinese government's social credit uh, policy, which is really about political compliance, but it also has to do with compliance with COVID rules. And because of the use of AI and so on, uh, China has uh, taken it upon itself to, to uh, supervise and oversee the uh, lives and the movement of uh, large numbers of of people in order to ensure political compliance, but they're also using that in the course of COVID enforcement. Um, a, a third element or another element of the socioeconomic impacts is, is a political issue, which is it's, uh, the COVID controls are reinforcing government controls uh, uh, generally. And this is occurring elsewhere globally as COVID controls become a potentially permanent uh, repression measure. We've seen it in Russia. We've seen uh, echoes of this in Brazil, Venezuela, Hungary, and India. And so the question really becomes at what point do the COVID controls uh, needed as they are, uh, be uh, morph into a broader control by authoritarian governments. And that's something we're certainly seeing in China and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, a related issue is PRC government responses on COVID, uh, particularly the so-called COVID zero policy. So uh, reactions to recent lockdowns, especially in Shenzhen and Shanghai, uh, have not been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, people are um, unhappy with the restrictions on their lives, but it also has a lot to do with the economy. And it's engendered a very vigorous debate over whether China's authoritarian response is a superior, reflects a superior government system. And uh, we've seen this same argument being made on China's response to climate change. And that issue is not, uh, is not resolved, but it's a very lively debate. And another issue on the political side is the issue of Xi Jinping's uh, leadership. So for example, uh, China's official documentation on, on uh, COVID, including a white paper issued in 220, uh, claim uh, Xi Jinping's personal leadership in all of COVID matters. And recently, uh, Xinhua has suggested that, that uh, Xi Jinping actually sort of devised the COVID zero policy. Policy. So, so he is personally very, very closely linked with the successes or failures of China's COVID control policies, and that has an impl uh, implications for uh, regime succession and his own personal leadership. Uh, another element is uh, the issue of COVID and China's foreign relations. So we've seen already alienation of China from, from the West, so to speak, on debates about COVID origins. And we've all heard about the debates about whether it, the lab leak or just zoonotic transfer. And I think that debate continues, although I, I frankly personally think uh, there are other things that we should really be focusing our energies on. But nonetheless, there are, that has contributed to China's alienation from the West. Also disagreements on lockdowns. On, on vaccines and so on. And it's important to note uh, the importance of uh, Chinese traditional medicine, which is being emphasized by the regime as a solution to COVID and the colonial history of foreign medicine in China, all of which affect uh, China's foreign relations with, uh, with other countries in the context of COVID. Uh, another point on this is China's uh, active use of vaccine diplomacy uh, and South-South cooperation to uh, basically uh, leverage the crisis to a uh, opportunity to expand its, uh, its influence uh, in the developing uh, world. 
Uh, and then the uh, last uh, points that I was going to make have to do with Hong Kong and Taiwan. So we see the crisis in Hong Kong, where the fifth and by far the worst wave of COVID is uh, raging through the society, uh, 3,000 dead, a half a million infected. Uh, the impacts on older residents without vaccination or with uh, PRC vaccines, which are have been shown to be somewhat less than optimally effective, uh, have also contributed to this. And this is where the issue of Xi Jinping's leadership has come into play because uh, she has directly criticized the Hong Kong government and claimed they should or asserted that they should take, quote, main responsibility, end quote, for managing the COVID crisis uh, in a way uh, suggesting that the responsibility for the uh, current crisis in, in, uh, uh, in Hong Kong is not on his uh, file. Uh, the Hong Kong situation has also raised questions about COVID zero uh, crackdowns and PRC's authoritative dominance, particularly in light of the recently enacted national security law, which makes uh, public discussion of virtually any government policy uh, potentially uh, criminal offense. And lastly, Taiwan, uh, as an example of a kind of a liberal democratic approach in, in Asia, there certainly have been lockdowns at partial lockdowns, but um, uh, a great deal of community involvement. And in some ways, uh, Taiwan is seen as sort of an exemplary response in comparison to the PRC by having a balance between controls and, uh, and uh, still allowing uh, the economy and society to function in something resembling a normal way. So, so those are the sort of the five, uh, areas that I've been focused on in light of uh, my own work. And, uh, and I hope those are helpful and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Pittman. You've covered a lot of ground very, uh, very quickly. Uh, and certainly they raised uh, some of your, many of your points raised important questions. Uh, let's turn next uh, to Brian, and then we'll open up the conversation among all three of us. Brian? Uh, thank you, Craig. And like Pittman, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in this conversation and thank the Emeritus College for uh, arranging it. I'm a relatively newly minted Emeritus a professor retiring in 2021. Uh, my appointment had been in the political science department uh, and also then uh, I held administrative appointments in the Liu Institute of Global Issues and also at the Institute of of Asian research. Uh, my research uh, largely focused on security order of the Asian Pacific and also then on Canadian uh, foreign and security policy, and most recently on UN peacekeeping, particularly China's engagement in UN peacekeeping. And today, then, I'd like to uh, make four particular comments uh, with regard to the functioning of the international system. Uh, under, uh, under COVID. Uh, but first, I think uh, we have to take into account uh, the current COVID situation. And it's difficult to get our heads around that because locally, at least, one feels a combination of, of weariness and to a certain extent, uh, complacency. But we're losing sight of the overall human toll in the broader picture. 60 million cases, 6 million deaths, a disease that is constantly morphing into new variants, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth wave washing through the system, a highly contagious disease, but spread by asymptomatic people. And it's springing up in countries previously viewed as having controlled the virus. Uh, Pittman characterized uh, China, South Korea with its 350,000 cases a day at one point, Hong Kong with the highest per capita death rate, uh, and the US about to reach 1 million deaths and still reaching 70, 750 deaths a day. And so overall, I think there's a sense of disruption, division, fractionization, dysfunction of the established globalized international system. And following on those lines, I'd introduce four ideas into our conversation. Uh, my remit being to, as I said, consider how COVID has affected the functioning of, of the system. And the first comment is taken from a broad conceptual perspective. What we are experiencing are the efforts to manage a dynamic transnational global phenomena by a system of state actors. That is actors who are defined and motivated by the defense of sovereignty, territoriality and nationalism. And this is, an, in essence, a perfect example of what pervades global governance overall. State actors are motivated by realistic, uh, realist logics of self-interest, non-cooperation, 
and zero sum policies, and they seek to protect, in quotes, their citizens through futile efforts to close their ultimately porous borders. As Adam Tooze has, Tooze has characterized it, the result is that the international system formats politics such that global issues are difficult to translate into domestic relevance and action. And we've certainly seen that. The second comment and concerns, broadly speaking, governance. COVID has come to be seen as a metaphor for the collapse and failure of governance across all levels. While not fully responsible, COVID has opened new tensions and has accelerated and heightened existing tensions. And this has occurred at an unfortunately opportune moment for a system already fraught with major power tension and strategic competition and has reduced the prospects for major cooperation just when they're most needed. If we look at the international multilateral level, we see multilateral institutions already being under serious stress. You look at the UN Security Council, uh, the WTO, for instance, and this is through a lack of resources, political deadlock, but more fundamentally, our multilateral institutions are not fit for purpose. Not fit for purpose given the scope of today's global problems. And with COVID, this has been most apparent, obviously, concerning the WHO, the World Health Authority which is under-resourced, hampered by its structure, slow to respond, and once COVID hit, was ignored by states who quickly turned to nationalist, sovereignty protectionist responses, contrary to WHO advice and contrary to international health uh, regulations. This has been compounded by a crisis of governance at the national level. Health systems are seen to have been unprepared, under-equipped. There's been an absence of social safety nets to protect populations. And this has been made worse by politicization of health policies for partisan advantage. And as Pittman has pointed out, opportunistic manipulations of bans, detentions, et cetera, by authoritarian regimes. And as we see, the grafting of COVID policies onto right-wing and conservative political movements. Two phrases or two phenomena have come to characterize state response to COVID. One is COVID nationalism. The second is vaccine nationalism. And I make a point of, of pointing to the US at this point. It has aban it abandoned its role as the international leader in public health. Prior crises like Ebola saw the US take a particularly strong and leadership position, essentially providing leader, public good of leadership to, to get a, a pandemic, uh, get a virus under control. And what one sees is this having been destroyed, I think would be the word by Trump, or, or at least deserted under Trump. And at the national level, the, the country has failed, failed spectacularly to protect its own population. One million deaths remains the largest accounted for uh, number of deaths due to COVID uh, in the world. So the third comment I have is how COVID has deepened inequities and the vulnerabilities of disadvantaged populations. Certainly we see this at the domestic level in our own society, but globally, although cases and fatality rates may be seen to be lower comparatively as in Africa, the social economic impact of COVID has been severe on economies through tourism, uh, food supply issues, fragile health systems, and so on. The overarching concern is vaccination of these large populations viewed as ultimately necessary to thwart a zootonic disease largely spread, as I said before, through, the, through asymptomatic people. And here's where one confronts the impacts of vaccine nationalism. With 70% of the developed world vaccinated, one third or less in low income developing countries has been vaccinated. In its estimates, there will be another two years through 2023 to achieve a global vaccination uh, uh, state that would uh, tend to, to mitigate against uh, further uh, further action through, through, through COVID. Um, my final comment then concerns COVID and, and conflict. 
is the historical relationship between conflict and disease has been that more deaths are caused from disease uh, on the battlefield and in affected civilian populations, more deaths through disease than through uh, direct uh, uh, conflict uh, uh, wounds. And certainly this is due to unsanitary conditions on the battlefield and beyond absence of any medical and humanitarian provision and importantly, unregulated movement of populations, IDPs and refugees. So then if you look at COVID and the Ukrainian conflict, what do you see? You see pre-conflict vaccination rates in Russia of only 50%. The response to COVID has been relatively muted. It's an interesting discussion. Lockdown in Moscow occurred for a week, but subsequently feud restrictions. And why? Analysts highlight that Russia under Putin is a repressive authoritarian system, but whose capacities for popular control are fragile. There may well be a reluctance to mobilize the population around pandemic control, which would expose the lack of competence and compliance failure of the government and potentially excite anti-government sentiment. Putin can mobilize around a nationalistic response to the Ukraine, but not with regard to COVID. So if we turn and look at the Ukraine, the Ukraine is only 35%, the population is only 35% vaccinated. This is because of vaccine hesitancy, because of the tensions of, of ongoing uh, conflict in, in uh, Ukrainian territory. It's because of health system capacity. It's also because of disinformation campaigns of which Russia is, has certainly been, been uh, blamed for, for, for spreading. And the impact of this conflict is yet to be seen, but one looks to refugee and IDP populations in the millions spreading across Europe and beyond into countries like Poland, 60% vaccinated, Belarus, 60% vaccinated, Germany, 76% vaccinated, Canada, 83 vaccinated. And the point is what we need to look for, guard against, attempt to protect against or, or at least address is that conflict through the Ukrainian situation is going to spread, uh, is going to be a vector, a major vector in spreading uh, COVID into uh, populations that were otherwise uh, relatively protected through vaccination. And I'll leave, I'll leave it on that uh, uh, uncertain and concerning note. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm sorry, thank you, Brian. Uh, you, you have given us much more to think about. Uh, so we've got uh, three uh, very thoughtful initial presentations on the table. Uh, before I open it up to conversation among our three distinguished scholars, uh, let me just remind everyone that if you have questions to put them in the chat box and I'll relay them at a later stage to or conversants, and uh, I'll, perhaps I'll just start off the conversation among the three of you with uh, asking a question that's mainly related to the point that Pittman made about the uh, lockdowns in China and the effect on supply chain. And that's a question about globalization. Uh, so globalization was already um, retreating to a, a, a small degree after 30 plus years of expansion uh, pre-COVID. Uh, COVID has certainly raised questions about uh, how sensitive societies are to uh, global ch supply chains. Uh, and so there was a great deal of speculation during, during the, the two years of COVID about a further retreat from globalization. And uh, and more, more reliance on local suppliers. Uh, and then of course the war in Ukraine has uh, probably, uh, will probably have a, a major impact on globalization. So what are the implications uh, of that? In particular, uh, I mean, you, you discussed at some length uh, the Chinese situation for countries that have 
benefited very substantially from 30 years of globalization. Uh, what do you see the implications being uh, down the road if we're going to retreat substantially from it? Well, uh, I, I'd, I'd love to hear from Brian on this particular topic, but um, my own uh, thought uh, is that uh, perhaps the COVID uh, crisis may uh, sort of uh, uh, accelerate or, or, or intensify uh, some of the uh, questions about uh, the desirability of globalization and whether changes should be made and so on. Uh, I, I certainly am aware that, that Canada is, uh, is still um, active in the Pacific Economic Cooperation process and the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation process, both of which are considered to be uh, examples of globalization. So I, I'm, uh, I, I would be interested to see uh, the effect of COVID per se. It's possible, of course, and, and I defer to you and, and Brian and others on this, but it, it's certainly possible that the, that the um, uh, general sort of public, but more importantly, political uh, questioning about the virtues of globalization and perhaps some questions about uh, local development and, and, uh, and how to protect uh, equ equities and how to address inequalities and so on and so forth are uh, sufficiently strong that, that COVID is, I mean, I'm sorry, that, that globalization is already sort of going through a major challenge and is weakening and so on, and COVID may hasten that. But at the same time, uh, the issues that COVID uh, raises may also instill people to take measures that actually reinvigorate those supply chains and, and, and try to insulate uh, globalization type of both economic, but more importantly, or equally importantly, uh, socio-cultural exchanges, um, uh, because uh, the conclusion is that globalization is desirable and should be kept. Now, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I guess I'm suggesting that we that we look at COVID as a perhaps a you know a uh, you know an accelerator or or a catalyst, if you will. But uh, but the the questions about the future of globalization and its desirability, as you suggest, are are there already? And and really, the uncertain question is: Is COVID going to catalyze those and make them more powerful or is COVID going to be used or, or seen as a way to reinvigorate globalization because of the need for global cooperation in responding to this pandemic? Okay. So short answer is I don't know. <laughs> Brian, well, I, I, I agree with Pittman in that regard. I. I, and I, Craig, I suspect you as an economist have, have your own views on this, but I think one, one began to see pushback against globalization from domestic, from, from, from domestic uh, populations uh, in, in uh, uh, wealthier countries uh, proceeding. And with uh, COVID, COVID comes into a system where you already have efforts by the US in particular to decouple its economy from from, from that of, uh, of China. And those two economies clearly were the, the driving forces of the driving forces of, of the overall uh, situation of, of globalization. And so I am concerned, I think, at, at the prospect of, of further decoupling and further, uh, and further uh, uh, isolation of, of large uh, economies like that. I'd like to agree with Pittman that, that we could see a reinvigoration. And where that might occur is on, the, is on health issues and on development of uh, vaccinations and, and preparedness uh, policies to, uh, to deal with the, the COVID and future uh, pandemics. Okay. Perhaps I could... Uh pose another question which was is in the chat box but it's also relevant uh, precisely relevant to what we're just talking about uh, and and the role of international institutions like the world health organization and this is from paul morantz our failures in dealing with covid likely to result in better planning to deal with future foreseeable threats and i i assume that's both at the national level and uh, the international level. I'll take that on very quickly. I think the answer is no. Uh, one does not see efforts, uh, multilateral efforts to bolster 
uh, WHO or, or to create alternate uh, alternate multilateral structures that that could uh, step into step into its place. And one does not see governments coming to terms with their own issues of preparedness. Uh, goodness, the U.S. Congress uh, just recently uh, hacked out components of, of the budget that were supposed to go for for uh, uh, dealing with with COVID and and just this the the notion of of uh, preparedness. This is not, unfortunately, a politically palatable or or politically positive agenda for for domestic legislators. Okay. Any any other comments by the three of you, or will I pose another question from the chat box? Yeah. Somebody asked about my reaction to uh, Paul's question. And I think there will be better planning for foreseeable future events, but those aren't the problem. The problem is unforeseeable future events. And what is foreseeable and what is not, it's a kind of elastic uh, characteristic because, you know, we could have said, well, there have been lots of worldwide um, pandemics before. We can predict that there'll be another one. We could have said that there were incursions by a large country against one of its smaller neighbors before. How come we didn't foresee the invasion of Ukraine? There have been all kinds of things before that we didn't use as evidence for preparing for similar events later on. And I think that's what human beings are best at. Um, you know, as, as the old saying goes, the generals always prepare for the last war, not for the next war. And I think human beings tend to be like that. The other thing is, you know, with uncertainty is stressful and it's much more comfortable to prepare for what you know about and where you have past evidence of what worked and what didn't may not be very clear evidence, but there's some evidence. And so it's much easier, it's much easier to plan for the last war than for the next war. Nobody knows what the next war is going to be like. There's also a cognitive effect of the things that I talked about. That is that people who are um, experiencing the effects of high anxiety, uh, reduced uh, reduction of the familiar ways they to deal with anxiety. One of the ways you deal with it is social reinforcement. Well, if you're not allowed to interact with other people, then you can't get that. Um, things like that. So when that happens, in addition to isolation and confinement, uh, that also has a cognitive effect on people. And I think you have to remember that leaders of nations are still human beings, and they're subject to the same stressors and the same fears and the same limitations of how they deal with that uh, as anybody else. And so if they're suffering from um, stress disorder of some sort, um, and their cognitive processes are impaired, which cognitive processes get under isolation and confinement, especially if it goes on for a while, uh, the decisions they make are not the best possible decisions and can be rash and can be um, short of foresight and short of sensible consideration of what might happen next and so on. So my answer to, to Paul's question is that I would find it very unlikely that um, the, the effect of all of this is going to be better planning for uh, future crises of various sorts and not just crises of, of widespread disease, but, wide, but, but crises of international aggression or, or who knows what, unforeseeable crises giant uh, meteorites about to hit the earth, whatever. I wanted to just add one uh, thought, uh, which uh, turns us back from the individual to the, to the collective. But, uh, you know, I think the, uh, um, the challenges that have been discussed already and, and uh, 
I'm thinking particularly the global governance implications of all this. Um, but uh, the WHO, for all of its faults, and, uh, and there are obviously many, but um, one of the standard WHO uh, positions is that their ability to uh, assist in local crises, say with China and COVID, uh, depends entirely on the assent of the local government. And, and this points to the whole question of, uh, of sovereignty, as Brian uh, mentioned that. And you know, it, is, um, it is possible, uh, and this is something that I'm working on in the context of COVID, climate change, and, and, uh, and involuntary migration, which is that uh, you know, some of these problems, in fact, all three of those, and there are plenty of other ones, meteorites or war or what have you, really do demand global responses. And those global responses to be effective in this kind of a crisis seems to me uh, need to be more than just, uh, you know, uh, the kind of assent that comes with no diminution of sovereignty and no commitments on actual real costs and so on and so forth. And so these kinds of crises may um, lead to opportunities to really rethink uh, the primacy given sovereignty ideas, ideology in international affairs. And, and I think that that is obviously a big, a big lift, but I think it's something that's worth uh, uh, thinking about because uh, the crises that we're looking at going forward, and I look at climate change in particular, but, but COVID too, they really do require uh, states to subordinate their own uh, interests and their own sovereignty to the good of the whole. And unless states are willing to do this, and particularly the United States and China, but others as well, um, I'm, I'm, I worry about our ability to really deal with these issues. Uh, one of the other points that comes to my mind, which is related to this, is the whole question of preparation. You know, there's a, a preparedness. I mean, I, I think that there's a political economy around uh, what sorts of preparedness are going to be supported by governments and which aren't. And, uh, and again, to, to prepare against the unknown, it's, uh, again, it's a big lift to ask for uh, commitments of resources and particularly opportunity costs uh, to uh, protect against uh, unknown threats and so on. That's always a difficult one. But even when they are known threats, um, we think of Canada's strategic decision not to invest in domestic production of vaccines. And we have to ask the question, well, why did that happen? And was that about preparedness for an event? Was that about denial that an event would happen? Or was that about the political economy of these sorts of questions? And, and so that together with the sovereignty question uh, in, you know, maybe should invite us all to, to sort of rethink these structural conditions for um, global cooperation. Thank you, Pat Pittman. Uh, this is a good time to uh, raise a, a question that the, the kind of question that you would expect from an economist, and it came from an economist, uh, Ralph Winter, uh, but it's closely related to what uh, you and Peter were just saying. And here's Ralph's comment. Politicians are not rewarded for preventing a disaster that has a small probability. The voting public does not spend resources being aware of all risks. Does this mean that policy on future risks is, is doomed to failure? I think you've both already answered that to an important extent, <laughs> saying yes, uh, but you may want to elaborate on that. Well, personally, I think this is where leadership, government leadership comes in, which is that it's about education and it's about awareness building and it's about uh, helping the voters or the other political influencers, shall you say, uh, to appreciate the importance of investing in things that are long term and that are perhaps have lower levels of certainty and so on. And, and that's really about education and political leadership to build a popular consensus around uh, cooperation on a whole variety of issues that are going to require global cooperation for us to resolve. But so maybe it's not doomed, but it's certainly a challenge. Yes, thank you. Peter, did you want to add to that? I would like to say good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People don't think that way. Politicians especially don't because they're thinking for the next election or the next regime change or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And uh, the ordinary citizen thinks maybe as far as their children's lifetime probably most of them not even that far, and certainly not long enough. Every time somebody comes up with a plan, you know, what happens to the 50-year plan? 
well, none of us is going to be here to find out. Um, and most people think I'm worried about next year, not 50 years from now. So I, I think that, you know, I, 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 I admire your optimism, Pittman, but I think it's um, probably not going to be borne out by what happens. You know what? We might really draw asked? some. We, um, we might draw some thoughts or lessons from what we're seeing as to govern those governments that are more have more effectively uh, dealt with COVID, and they're governments that have uh, competency, uh, you know, functional competency, competency, and trust in in government, and that that trust maybe even in authoritarian societies, uh, but. Uh, those are the societies of South Korea, as, 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 as Pittman has mentioned, I think the contrast between Canada and the United States is in many ways uh, 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 built around those. And in those societies, I suspect we do have a better chance uh, in, in, a society, in societies that are ruled by, by uh, self-interested uh, autocrats. Uh, I, think there's, I think the chances are, are incredibly low. That's a good point, and uh, we can even draw some conclusions, and hopefully the public will draw some conclusions from that uh, within Canada, looking at differences across provinces and how they responded. I think one of, one of the effects of COVID and one of the effects of terror management, uh, as I mentioned, is a general distrust of uh, people who are not fully on your side on anything. And you see that in the United States a lot, obviously. And, you know, we had the, the freedom procession to Ottawa, the trucker strike. Uh, we've had a number of other similar kinds of things. We have demonstrations all the time in many of the of, of Canadian cities. All of that, I think, is exacerbated by what we have been going through regarding the COVID, partly because government and government spokespeople like doctors, uh, public health physicians, have been making authoritative statements about how to deal with the, with the pandemic. And then a week later, they reversed course and said the opposite or something different. And eventually people say, you know, these people, these guys don't know what they're talking about. So why should we refrain from having a family party or going to a movie or whatever. This, this business about follow the science, the science changes all the time. People get frustrated. Peter, in your research, uh, what has been the effect of the, of the internet? That is the, the communication uh, channels now uh, large for for most people, largely being being through the through uh, digital com communication. Are you asking me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Look, um, when you're in isolated, confined environment, especially a remote one, which is the ones that I mostly study, um, any contact with the outside world relieves stress to some extent, unless, of course, the messages that you get are very scary. But it does not compensate for being together face to face, watching people's facial expressions and gestures, contact comfort, which is very important, touching, and so on. So yeah, uh, having the internet is better than not for the most part, although social media, I'm not so sure about, it tends to, tends to proliferate uh, messages that we'd be better off without, but, um, you know, trolling and all that. But uh, yeah, on the whole, it's beneficial. And when you can get in touch with loved ones or even acquaintances or get the news and so forth, um, it reduces uncertainty, it, it reduces stress to some extent. So the provision of free access to internet in places like the International Space Station, for example, or Antarctic and Arctic uh, communities is, I think, a net good. But I think one has to be very careful not to think that it makes up for the lack of per 
personal interaction for contact because it does not. Here, uh, thank you for that. C can I follow up with a question about uh, working from home? Uh, one of the big ways that uh, many countries responded to uh, to COVID was with lock lockdowns for health reasons. Uh, and uh, many people who previously worked in office places, office spaces or in other uh, types of facilities, if they were able to, uh, began to work at home. Now, working at home uh, was already rising before COVID, but from a very small base. Uh, so it was already growing, uh, but certainly it had a huge spurt of growth during COVID and, and the uh, the technology that facilitates uh, working from home improved dramatically as well. We're, we're on one of them right now. <laughs> uh, and there's quite a bit of speculation about the extent to which working from home will stick. Now, obviously, for some occupations and, and uh, types of work, it won't, it's not feasible for frontline workers, for example. But for many office workers, it is feasible. Uh, and uh, and there are important benefits, uh, reduced commuting time, more flexibility in your workday, uh, and being able to live away from where the central office is and so on. Uh, and we're going to see over the next couple of years, the extent to which it sticks. But do you see uh, potentially uh, negative social consequences of an increased fraction of the workforce who are working from home and not getting as much social interaction in the workplace as, the, as they used to? Well, I think that like most things, it's a trade-off. Um, staying at home is comfortable. Uh, if you have a comfortable home and if you have a comfortable social circle with whom you can stay in touch, if you have somebody who lives in the same household that you get along with or more than one person, or if you have neighbors that you can still socialize with, or anybody you can still socialize with. Working from home doesn't mean you have to stay home all the time. Okay? And I think that human beings are adapted, certainly our generations, the ones that are on earth now, are adapted to dealing with other people face to face, not always remotely. We get to it sometimes remotely, but we, we still miss personal contact. Now, I, that I've seen surveys that showed that a, a fairly high proportion of employed people who have been working from home are asked, what would you do if your employer ordered you to get, go back to the workplace? And quite a few of them said, I'd quit. That tells you something. Um, and, you know, people don't have to get dressed up and people don't have to be on their and people can feel like it, at least in some context, and so on. There's some things, that, some things you can't do from home, right? If you're a, a road worker or an automobile, automobile mechanic, you can't work from home. It's different for people who work with words and, and ideas and so on, people like us. Um, I think, though, that there, there is a danger to it. Well, first of all, there's a danger for children's development. He, I think, face-to-face -face social interaction with other children and with other adults, not only their parents all the time, uh, to, to learn how to get along with others and how to deal with the real world. There is a real, you know, there's a hard real world out there. And if you're at home all the time, you don't learn the dangers that it holds and the opportunities that it holds. So I think on the whole, it's a, working from home is a good option for many people. But I think it's risky to assume that it's good for any particular person or for society at large. It may lead to more fractionation, uh, to less you know, humane interaction, less charity, and so on. Um, Nobody, has, I don't think the, the research is being done at the level that it should be, needs to be. And maybe now that, that um, working from home has taken a kick up uh, because of the pandemic, because of the lockdowns and so on, uh, maybe we'll find out, uh, maybe we'll collect those data.
Okay. Uh, any further uh, discussion among the three of you, or do you want me to uh, ask some more questions from our audience? Okay, well, uh, here's one from Du Stein. Uh, Pittman spoke of altruism at a national level. We know that altruism exists at an individual level, but has there ever been anything like altruism by a nation? Uh, well, <clears throat> um, I am not a psychologist, obviously, so I hesitate to speculate on these sorts of things, but I, uh, I have long suspected that altruism is never a pure thing or seldom a pure thing, that sometimes altruism is uh, expressed for all sorts of reasons that have to do with self-affirmation. And so uh, I don't know what pure altruism actually is, to be honest, but uh, maybe that's just my own short-sighted vision, but um, I, I do think that it, at the state level, I mean, I, I take what, what Brian is saying about uh, national interest and so on, but in the calculation of national interest, uh, it may be that the calculation of national interest of a state uh, like Canada, for example, may involve uh, providing assistance to countries where the actual benefit to Canada is maybe about reputational advantage, it may be about, you know, uh, setting an example to appreciate uh, to increase Canada's persuasive leverage on other issues. I mean, there may not be any number of uh, of reasons, but I think uh, Canada is an example, and and there are plenty of others where things like in China. If you think of China's foreign aid budget, think of foreign aid as as it's it it looks like altruism, but it may also be self interest. And I think uh, altruism and self interest are kind of related to each other. I defer to Peter on this, but uh, so I think there have been plenty of examples of of something that looks like altruism at the international level, but you know, you plumb reasonably deeply and you start to find out that there's self-interest involved too, but that doesn't necessarily negate the uh, beneficial impacts. Peter, did you want to add to that? I don't want to dominate this conversation, but I, I'd like to, like to weigh in on, on this one. And that is, I am, first of all, altruism is a philosophical question, not a psychological question because some some people argue, philosophers argue, that whatever you do is in your own self-interest, even if it looks like it. At the very least, you feel good that you've done it, okay? And that's, sort of, that's a benefit. But I think you have to make a distinction here, and maybe the political scientists can uh, weigh in on this, that the country, the government, may do something for selfish reasons, which may be good or bad, um, but that's not the reason why the citizens do it necessarily. So, and I, I can give you a personal example. Right after the war, I was in Europe and um, care packages started coming. Care packages were food and clothing and stuff like that, donated by individuals and families in the countries of the victorious side, sent to lots of people all over, but including people on the defeated enemy side. Okay, now, political scientists argue that, that, that all of that was uh, to uh, deter people, the countries from going communist or God knows what, but the, but the people who donated that, isn't that food and, that, and those clothes, were not doing it to deter communism. They were doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They knew that the people in the defeated countries were suffering, they were hungry, uh, their possessions had been pretty much destroyed, just as the, one, the Ukrainians now, and so on. And they were doing it to be kind. And that's altruism. And I think human beings, individual human beings, have altruistic motives, whether governments do or not. And the governments you can argue about forever. That's all. I'd only add to the conversation along the lines of both of, of you that that one does see, I think, particularly say in the Scandinavian countries where you have created a political culture that, for, that does see the need to sustain consistent, uh, consistent delivery of, of foreign assistance. Certainly there may be, as Pittman said, non-altruistic aspects to it, but I think it, it's an example, if you will, of mobilization of uh, civil uh, culture uh, around, if you will, what's seen as as uh, as a positive uh, uh, foreign policy. So 
So Brian, there's another question that uh, you may want to take an initial stab at. Uh, it, it gets back to the, it returns to the issue that we discussed earlier about how, and I think it was the point you made about how we may learn from differences across countries and how they responded and, and even differences across within countries across regions and how they responded to COVID and, and the public may and come to appreciate the role of governments that do things well versus ones that don't. Um, this is a question about Australia's approach uh, where individual states, so the question is, would enjoy a comment from either, from either panelist uh, on Australia's approach where individual states within the country close their borders but my understanding is that COVID numbers are now rising quickly in, for example, Western Australia. I don't have, I don't think I have anything specific to contribute to a discussion about Australia. Uh, my guess is that the capacity to completely close the borders of uh, a, a locale, a state within, Australia are 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 pretty limit, are pretty limited. That is, to, to to do that suggests a level of authoritarian control that is pretty unlikely. And given the disease and the way it, the way it spreads through various vectors, uh, I think it's a I think it's a policy that that uh, is unlikely to be effective. Now, the the comparison that the questioner may be looking at is uh, Canada's maritime provinces. And they did create a, at least a, a fairly tight bubble uh, for a period of time, which was seen to be effective. But uh, I would say the reason there is small population, isolated territory, and a capacity to be, at least for a short term, relatively self-sufficient. And I wonder if those apply to uh, an Australian situation. I just was going to just add to that, just a as a way of just thinking about these issues, because I can't really speak to Australia, but and that is that uh, there is, as has already been noted, but I think it's worth continuing to remind ourselves about this: the uh, the the extent to which COVID control policies mesh with or reinforce a whole nother set of social. Uh, attitudes about exclusion, about othering, about threats and that sort of thing. And, and unfortunately, we've seen politicians got manipulate this, but uh, in, in many different ways. But, you know, I think it's worth uh, looking at country responses on uh, on COVID, for example, and comparing them with uh, responses of the same countries on things like refugee migration, for example, or on uh, international collaboration on climate, or what have you. And I admit that's the project I'm currently working on. But nonetheless, you know, I do think that the the uh, political dynamics, the political culture, the, the the value systems to the extent that they could be narrowed down to anything concrete, um, I think they tell us a lot about how countries, uh, country governments uh, uh, respond to COVID in the context of their policies and reactions on a whole variety of other related things, again, like migration and, and so on. So, so I think uh, we, we don't want to necessarily look at each any, any particular regimes, whether it's China or, or the US or Canada or what have you, uh, COVID policy in isolation. I think it is part and parcel of a much broader kind of spectrum of uh, policies that really have to do with um, outsiders and that has to do with uh, international collaboration and so on. And uh, related to that is it, it's very disappointing, frankly, to me that that the that that COVID wariness, shall we say, and, and I've experienced this personally, but I know a lot of other people have as well. It, it um, you know, there's a danger if it really entrenches in the society and you develop a permanent sense of wariness among members of the society with each other. I mean, that doesn't support social cohesion and has, I would say, all sorts of Influ you know, bad influences, but uh, anyway, just two thoughts on that. Maybe, maybe I'll just add that, uh, I mean, I was, I was quite interested in following the Australian experience. I, I haven't followed it in depth, but uh, it is remarkable uh, 
the actions they took, say, compared to Canada, they completely cl closed their borders, even to their own citizens who happened to be abroad when the closure occurred. And so you had families not, you know, not being able to be united for extended periods of time. And they did close borders at times with, within states. Uh, and I guess individual states had the ability uh, legally to, to do that. Um, but I guess it's, it's important to keep in mind, there's a couple of factors. First of all, Australia has a history of, uh, well, first of all, it's an island. And secondly, it has a history of uh, having to deal with uh, infectious situations. Uh, and uh, so I think their, their willingness to take drastic steps uh, reflects in part that history. Uh, the other is that they, they had put all their eggs in one basket largely in terms of vaccine pre preparedness. They, they had planned to, uh, they had a vaccine that was domestically developed. It, it turned out in the trials to be quite effective, but it also led to, because of the way it was constructed, it led to false positives for AIDS. So people who uh, were getting false positives for AIDS, uh, that, that was just an untenable situation to continue to promote that. So then they tried to uh, purchase the AstraZeneca vaccine from uh, the British and Australian company that produced that vaccine. I'm sorry, the British and Swedish company that produced that vaccine. And they had made a, a, a contract to do so, but they got caught in vaccine politics and Europe, uh, some of the European countries uh, blocked the, uh, the shipments to Australia for some time. So th there's there's a lot of reasons behind uh, the the, uh, the Australian approach, um, but like other countries that did really well initially by having quite severe lockdowns, New Zealand being another example, and South Korea being another, uh, they they've had difficulty more recently with these uh, the much more contagious variants like Omicron. Okay, we're aiming for uh, about a 3.30 closing, so we got about another 20 minutes. Were there any more uh, points that Brian and or Peter, Peter or Pittman wanted to make, or will I scroll through the questions once more? Okay, with the next one, um, this is not in any particular order. Uh, next to the affected patients and their families, one group that took a big hit from the uncertainty and moral distress related to the management of the pandemic is the healthcare workforce. Do you think that addressing that uncertainty and the related causes of moral distress should also be on the agenda for global governance? That's a question, I think. All of you could <laughs> take a shot at answering. Well, the first thing I would say is, I mean, it should be on the agenda for something. I, I uh, having a family member who has uh, spent the last two years uh, working in the uh, intensive care unit at Surrey Memorial Hospital and up to her ears in COVID patients for two years, I can just say personally that the effect on on the individuals involved and their colleagues and so on is severe. And I think that it's, uh, it is certainly something that needs to be addressed. And again, part of this is, uh, is about popular attitudes. I, I recall, um, and, and we used to do this down where, where we live, we used to go out at seven o'clock in the evening and go bang our pots and pans and show our support and so on. And that kind of faded with the fading of Delta last summer. And I haven't really seen it rekindled, although the uh, hospitalization rates and the death rates and so on continue. So, so the I think part of it is again building a level of popular awareness. And you know, I'm I'm not trying to be too uh, uh, well. I'll cling to the optimism part, or I'll cling to the hope part. But um, you know, I think that it's uh, part of it is about helping the society understand how each of these parts is interlinked and interdependent. And whether it's a patient with COVID who won't get a vaccine or a family member of, uh, you know, with, with, a, with a chronic condition or what have you who has been vaccinated but is still uneasy about 
interacting with the world or a healthcare worker who is uh, facing it every day. All of these are kind of interconnected. And part of it is uh, developing a political awareness among voters, but among politically uh, active members of the community um, that each of those elements has to be dealt with. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I think it's uh, fair to say that uh, the attention of the general public in and I just I, from news reporting and I I'm happy to be corrected on this, but you know there wasn't as much sensitivity to the exposure of frontline workers, truck drivers, for example, or grocery store workers. I mean, occasionally you'd see, you know, a note about it in the media or what have you. But by and large, uh, you know, it didn't get the attention that I certainly would have been more comfortable with. Um, I think uh, healthcare workers, there, you know, often you see that's you know attitudes about uh, their voluntarily taking on these risks and that's part of the job and all that sort of thing. So so I, I really do think that at a, before this can become something for a global agenda, it has to become a very prominent national agenda. And I think part of that is not is uh, both political leaders showing leadership to help people appreciate how interdependent and interconnected all these factors are, but also uh, developing that sense of social consensus on the need to address the social outcomes of COVID in all of its interdependent and interconnected ways. And I think we have to build some level of national consensus, not only in Canada, but in all the states of the world that then can help build a global uh, governance consensus. But I think it's a bit of one step at a time. And, and again, it's a big lift to try to continue to raise the appreciation and the, the consciousness and the uh, knowledge level and so on of, of all the disparate people in any particular country. But I think the task is there for us to grasp. And again, with other issues like climate, uh, I think it's just essential. Yeah, well, well put. Uh, and I mean, many of these were occupations we were having trouble staffing to begin with, even before COVID. Uh, there were, you know, there's been an ongoing shortage of nurses, for example, off and on. The magnitudes varied off and on over over the years, but it's it's been present for for an extended period of time, um, and uh, so this is good. This without some kind of a an approach such as you're mapping out, uh, this is just going to be exacerbated down the road. Well, I really like the that time when we when everybody went out at seven o'clock and banged their pots and pans and whatever. But it was a victim of compassion fatigue. People get tired of um, being compassionate, I guess, or at least doing something about it. And of course, one of the things that leads to burnout of healthcare workers is the same thing uh, as social workers and other, other kinds of helping professions. But the question is, you know, I, yes, we should, government should encourage people to do something about it. But the question is what? Uh, what do you do to show that you empathize, respect, honor, admire, whatever uh, these people that are that are undertaking these dangerous and on behalf of society and on behalf of the freedom? What do we do? Nobody. I mean, is there salaries? Wait. Does that do it? <laughs> make big salaries without anybody really admiring them very much or, or caring about them very much. So I don't, I don't have an answer to that one. What can the government do to ensure that compassion continues? Well, one thing they can do is to is to act out that compassion in their allocation of resources in the society. So, uh, uh, resources for the healthcare system that might uh, help uh, healthcare workers, social workers included, uh, avoid these twelve-hour shift arrangements, uh, which uh, lead to fatigue and I would say less than optimal performance, but seem to be <laughs> unavoidable, and no one seems to want to change them. I, I think it's uh, you know so so I think there are funding areas that can go into again things like minimum wage and things like housing and all those sorts of, you know, they're all familiar topics, but, you know, acting out compassion through allocations of resources is certain and, and to be doing it in a way that is explained to people. So people see it as efforts to try to build greater compassion into 
our social relations. And, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but uh, um, I think it's the government has a role to play, but people have a role to play too in, uh, in actually uh, requiring it of each other and demanding it of the government. Yeah. Yeah, I second what Pittman just said. I, I mean, I think you create uh, an argument for uh, more resources by pointing to people the difference that uh, better resourced uh, healthcare systems will have on their own on their own lives in reducing waiting times in in uh, in uh, uh, providing better services to them and their kids and so on and this can be done I mean crassly if you want to say it that way on on solely on an economic logic basis without without necessarily uh, bringing in the issue of of uh, uh, moral moral distress which I agree is important but I don't think you easily motivate uh, allocation of resources on the on that basis. These, these are also uh, professions that are fairly highly unionized in Canada. Uh, in fact, the Canadian public sector, broadly speaking, is fairly high, highly unionized. It's certainly much more unionized than the private sector uh, in Canada. Uh, and there's a role for their unions to play. They're, those are the ones, organizations that represent them collectively. Uh, there's a role for unions to, be, to play a role in this as well. Okay, I have another question, and this There's is a Peanuts cartoon that I. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, I was, yeah. By the way, uh, when I was dean, and people came up with me, came to me with really innovative ideas. I showed them this Peanuts cartoon, where Snoopy ends up saying, "Every time I come up with a good idea, somebody brings up the budget." Yeah, that's the problem. It's true. So. I mean, I think it's a great idea to, you know, as, as you've been saying, to increase the resources um, and we have to deal with where does the money come from. I have another right. question. Another, oh, go ahead, Pittman. Well, no, I mean, yes, I, I agree. But part of the issue is when we look at uh, allocation of resources, part of it is I mean, forgive me, but it's about changing the paradigm from perhaps from efficiency to something else. And uh, and I'll just give you one example from another life that I live, uh, where we had uh, we're putting on a show in a church for uh, for uh, our homeless project, and um, and we didn't charge admission. We had some pretty well known people performing, and and we didn't say to people, "You have to pay this amount to get in." We said, "Pay whatever you feel like." And we actually ended up getting more money than we would possibly have gotten with our highest expectation of ticket prices. And so I think there is that sense in people of wanting to do the right thing, but being hampered by all of the structures and norms and such that, that dominate our lives. And I think part of it is you know, a paradigm shift to think about uh, not simply how do we most efficiently run a hospital, but rather to include the well-being of the people in that hospital, both patients, uh, family members, and staff, and so on, in that calculation of what efficiency means, or, or even to shift the paradigm even farther than that. And so, you know, I, I realize that that is a big lift. I totally <laughs> I understand, but I do think it's worth having some discussion and thought about because uh, we're dealing with a global crisis, whether it's COVID or others, that are really going to require some paradigm shifting in our calculations of how we make decisions on on resource allocation or whatnot. So, so I would just think, if as long as we stay within the the parameters that we have now, uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm not. My optimism starts shaking a little bit. But if we can look at the possibility of really thinking about these things in a new way. Uh, that really includes things like compassion as part of the efficiency calculus. I think it's worth. Uh, I think it's worth exploring that. But but anyway, sorry, I talked too much already. Maybe I'll just add that uh, it, there is evidence from the so-called happiness literature that people get a great deal of satisfaction from helping others, not just helping themselves, but helping others. So so that's something worth broadcasting in this. Uh, in this vein. 
So I have another question here. Uh, this is for Peter. Uh, we, we've, we've covered some of this already, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, ask the full question. Uh, what, uh, if any, longer term consequences <clears throat> might we anticipate seeing on social behavior, such as avoidance of large gatherings, mask wearing and the like? Well, uh, I'm sorry to speak up here, but you know we think about mask wearing, and I realize, and I, I'm not giving up my mask anytime soon. So um, I realize it's uh, you know it's a it's a hassle, and uh, I don't like it, but I do it all day long. So, but I think it's worth remembering that uh, just from my time in China in the early days, I mean, you know, it was people wore masks around Beijing basically every day in the 80s when I was living there and in the 90s when I continued to be present in the 2000s, you saw people wearing masks all the time for any number of reasons, either disease related or environmentally, mostly environmentally related. And, and so I think it just becomes part of the, the local cultural kind of expression. And, uh, and I think that uh, it, it need not be seen as this overwhelmingly, overwhelming intrusion on liberty or overwhelming intrusion on you know, personal autonomy or whatever. I, I think people kind of get used to it and see benefits from it. So, so I don't know how that's gonna all play out here. I just know I'm not giving up my mask anytime soon and, uh, and uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. But there are societies, again, in Asia that I've participated in and seen both China and elsewhere where you know, mask wearing is not considered to be that unusual. I mean, try living through a dust storm in Beijing in March without a mask. That's going to be pretty darn hard. Perhaps we have time for uh, two more questions. Uh, I'll start with this one. Do you think our knowledge base concerning the nature of COVID and its impact is improving? We talk about the importance of good science, but I do not see our programs advancing. That's something any of you could take on. I'll reflect on, on just what I sort of, sorry, Peter. Uh, I'll reflect just on, on my recent experience when, I, when I've been sort of uh, trolling the internet and, and other sources looking for uh, information about COVID and current situations and so on. And, uh, I don't see the knowledge base uh, improving. If you want to dig deep enough, it certainly is improving if you, if you want to get into the science. But if you want to stay at a level where you believe that these, uh, these, this material is addressing a general population, I don't see much uh, knowledge base improvement there. COVID is a basically dropped off of the front page of our newspapers. Uh, either through complacency or, or through weariness. People are not interested in gaining more knowledge of, of, about COVID. And, and I think that's, a, I think that's a, 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 a concerning uh, situation. So, I mean, yes, uh, I think the knowledge base is improving if you want to dig for it and find it. But otherwise, in a general sense, uh, I'm somewhat less than, than positive. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I mean, certainly the science has been moving forward at a very dramatic rate, and that's been impressive. But with, whether the knowledge base among the general public has improved, uh, my, my sense is the same as yours, that it, uh, it, it hasn't been advancing very much and that people are, have, have gotten tired of following it closely. The polls I have seen, which a while back, before all this, generally indicated that science and scientists who are among the most respected sources of information among the public 
uh, more recently, that has taken a real hit and much less respect, much less trust. Um, and I think to a great extent, it's the fault of the way in which the talking heads that represented medical science, at least, um, communicated over, to the, over television and so on to the public because they very rarely indicated what I, th I think is the core of science, which is that the knowledge is tentative. It's not, we're not setting down rules carved in stone. It's always what we know as of right now, might change tomorrow and so on. Well, they have to do it that way. They have to say it changed. They have to say one day, you know, you have to wait four weeks between the first shot and the second shot. And then a month later, they said, well, you have to wait two weeks between the, and so on and so forth. And it's because when they first said it, they sounded like they, this was it. This was the fact, uncontestable from science. But it's not. Knowledge from science is not uncontestable. It's subject to more data. And um, the public that was not aware of that and was not informed of that was understandably, I think, disillusioned and angry when these very respected scientists change their minds every couple of weeks. And as I said, I think it's, it's the fault of the scientists for not communicating to the public that's the, what scientific knowledge is. It's not dogma. It's not handed down from God. It's what we know at the time. And therefore, it's changeable when we know more. I wish we had done it that way. Yeah, I very much agree. And, but it's also something that, as educators, we need to uh, teach better the scientific method and, and, and what does it mean by saying we go by the science uh, and how, you know, how paradigms change, how, how knowledge evolves. Uh, that's something that uh, I don't think I, I, it, we, we, I don't think we do as good a job of that as we as we could. If I could just add one thought on this, and, and of course, the contingency of scientific conclusions is is critically important to appreciate, and so on and so forth. But I, I think there's another dilemma, and and that is that you know people who are listening to a scientific expert speak of the knowledge that they have generated. You know, they, they don't really, they can't really say one way or the other. They don't really know it. They just rely on the expert. And, and this, I think, invites us to think about, and this is the bigger question for another day, I have no doubt, but it really has to do with the construction of knowledge generally, is, is, and the, the, the tension between deep specialization, which may be necessary to decide how many weeks go between a vaccine and it may change and so on and so forth. And a, a, uh, a contextual approach that looks at, dare I say, the interdisciplinary implications of those scientific conclusions. And I think often uh, political audiences, people, um, uh, they, if they don't understand the area, they're gonna rely on the expert. And if the expert changes their mind, this is the battle of the experts problem we see in litigation all the time. If the expert changes their mind, then somehow it's not their knowledge, but it's their very expertise, which ends up being challenged. But perhaps another way to help us communicate on uh, COVID issues and the science is to integrate the scientific conclusions with what this actually means in terms of the impact on on women or on poor people or on ethnic minorities, whatever. And to do that kind of intersectoral, interdisciplinary presentations about what the knowledge on COVID is to allow it to be more accessible and relevant and understandable for the general populace. And that's in that process of, of education and, and uh, building a, a social consensus about it. So I think we wanna be, you know, this is an opportunity to rethink how we actually construct knowledge and, and, and how we communicate it to various audiences. And obviously it's gonna vary depending on the audience and so on. Can I pick up on Pittman's point specifically about social consensus? Because I think we have to see COVID having occurred at a time where a substantial portion of our populations uh, are disaffected with their, their particular position within society, particularly economically, but also socially, and also an increasing distrust of governments, which they perceive as not having responded more largely to what they regard as, as their concerns. 
you add COVID into that and you also add opportunistic uh, channeling by uh, particular figures and politicians and you get it you get an environment like like we have at the moment um, i i sympathize or i empathize clearly with the with the arguments about about experts presenting things more more clearly and so on but i don't see that addressing the short-term uh societal issues that that uh, that, that we confront agreed well, it's time for us to uh, wrap up, uh, if not on an optimistic note, at least on a, a note of being much more informed than we were before. Uh, so on behalf of everyone who signed in, I want to thank Brian and Pittman and Peter for their drawing on their expertise to offer insights on this quite uh, important, but also very uh, diverse uh, set of questions. Uh, let me also mention that um, the Emeritus College is in the process of organizing more uh, such conversations uh, throughout the year. And if anyone is interested in proposing a topic uh, to reach out to the Emer Emeritus College administration uh, and uh, they'll, uh, they'll uh, take, take it up from there. Uh, so thank, thanks to the Emeritus College for organizing this. Thanks to our three conversants for their expertise and uh, their involvement. Uh, and I think we are finished for today. Well, thanks, Craig, and good to have seen you, Pittman and uh, Peter. Yes, th uh, thank you all. Thank you, Peter and, and Brian, and thanks, Craig, for chairing, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you.